You're very welcome along. We've been uh, threatening this for quite some time. I know myself and Fran announced it at the early part of the season. We haven't asked Norman Williamson yet on TV, but he will join us. And sure enough, you have come along. Well done. Yeah, we've been meeting Kev during the summer with the ponies and the kids, but... Um yeah, I suppose I had to give in to you. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I don't know why, but anyway, listen, it's good to be here. It's good to have you here as well. And Thanks. Norman, what an unbelievable career you had as a jockey. You're one of the top lads of your generation, a vintage generation as well. But uh, it seems a good while ago now, because you're retired since what? 2002, no? Really yeah, time? yeah, a long time ago. Um, yeah, it was a generation of... of Top jockeys. I'd, I'm, I'm not putting myself in the category of a lot of them, that's for sure. But but there was a huge amount at that time, huge amount of good jockeys. Um, there was 20 guys that you could put on a favourite in a champion hurdle, you know. Whereas now, I think because of the the big yards, there's one or two. There's not as many at the same level. Um, that time you had a lot of trainers with 30, 40, 50 horses, and they all had their their own first jockey. So I think that's what. Made the next level nowadays better jockeys, probably. You know? And Norman, you started off at uh, 16. What was your first job? Oh, yeah, it's 16. I was pony racing, did a lot of pony racing, and then um, I went to Dermot Wells and spent, spent probably three years there, I think. How um, did you come to go to Dermot Wells? Give your, you might not be a jump jockey, if you like. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I was doing very well pony racing, and um, well, Fran, at that time, you can imagine being in Cork with. There was no such thing as a mobile phone or anything, but um, somebody knew somebody who said I should be an apprentice in the car and off you go. And, and, and then you had to serve your time. You had to do three years um, or, or the guts of it. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time there and um, some great stories. You ride and work with the likes of McKinnon and, you know, the late David Parnell was there at the time. Um, but to tell you quickly, one morning we were out in the schooling ground waiting to ride work and um, there was a very good horse there at the time called Theatrical. He was second in an Irish derby, and we're waiting and waiting, and next thing, um, Dermot arrived on in the jeep, and I mean, who stepped out alongside him on the Leicester picket to ride <laughs> theatrical work? So you could imagine I was riding one of the lead horses, and, you know, things like that were amazing. But he was, he was very good to me. Um, there was fantastic horses there at the time. Grease Paint was there. Oh, yeah. He was second in the national at the time. Tommy Carmody. Um, no, Tommy Carmody. Um, he had a good horse, one to Glen Livet called Dark Raven. There were some, a few good jumpers. Um, but it was great, great horses, um, committed European champion sprinter. She was at the end of her tether at that stage, but she was there. And, um, you know, he, he gave me a few rides, and I was going to be too heavy to be a flat jockey. I was eight and a half, nine stone. And he then got me a job with P.P. Hogan, and, and it went from there, really. Yeah. And when you were riding in the pony racing scene, I know you're coming from Cork as well, ingrained in national hunt racing. Did you tie with the idea about being a flat jockey? Would you have liked to be a flat jockey? It's it's weird. Uh, I was speaking to Noel Mead earlier about he was talking about one of the young lads riding, and he says a jump jockey is not a job. He was saying to one of these flat guys, <laughs> he said it's lunacy. Um, <laughs> not too far out. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, you always and, and it's, I probably sound a bit like Paul Carberry, but I always loved jumping, and you loved you loved jumping, and and I suppose coming from a hunting background, as in I was hunting when I was young, you always kind of wanted to be a jump jockey. Like John Joe O'Neill, who I ended up riding a few horses for, was my idol at the time. And um, so that's how it went. But I was always going to be that little bit too heavy. Like people like my great friends, like Richard Hughes, says I should have been a flat jockey. But <laughs> there we go. Yes. So you, you've spent three years in Dormant Wilds. You had a couple of rides as an apprentice for him. Then you were getting too heavy, and he's organised a job for you to go to P.P. Hogan. Yeah, not as an apprentice. I took out an amateur licence, and um, he gave me a couple of rides on the flat. And um, he got me a job with P.P., and um, that was rough and tough. Um, <laughs> we learned a lot there, that's for sure. I'll tell you, I will tell you, I shouldn't be telling you, but I will tell you. I rode a, I rode a horse for him. Um, my first ride was in a piney point in Knock Long, and the horse was called, would you believe, Give Me a Break was the horse's name. And um, he won. And Roger Hurley, who's passed away, Roger was riding a horse and a four-year-old maiden um, two races later anyway, and he couldn't ride him, he got a fall or something, and so I got to ride in that horse. But he fell at the last upsides, and I broke a bone in my shoulder, and I phoned him from outside Limerick Hospital that night to tell him I had a bone broke, and he told me I was sacked. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> that is as true as I'm standing here. He says, you're sacked, you're sacked, you're sacked, you're sacked. And um, I went back and picked up my clothes. And as the years went by, um, I met PP years after. I went to a great man down in Cork called Gerald O'Donovan. 
Um, he's not with us for a long time, but um, he actually is Robert and Tyner's father-in-law. Okay. And he took a shine to me, and I started writing pile of pointers down there. And, um, you know, he, he ended up getting me involved with John Edwards in England. And so he was great to me. They were a fantastic family. Um, and Robert Tyner, who I was riding pony racing for, his father in the early days. So there was a huge connection there. And um, But that was PP. And then, of course, I ended up riding with Edward O'Grady, or for Edward. And Edward's mother was PP's sister. And as the years went by, she said to me one day, she said, PP always said that she sa- he sacked a great jockey who's going to be fantastic riders. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was 100% right, as it turned out, wasn't he? How, yeah. how, how did you handle that, though? You're a young rider, you're with the top point-to-point trainer, you're trying to make your way, and, you know, it's, it's uh, something you've got to really pick yourself up Yeah, on. it was. It was tough at the time, I suppose, which you get on with it. Mm. Um, you know, I think we're wired a bit different being flat jockeys, aren't we? <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. At the time, they were friends. They were tough times, but mm. time, times were very different. There was no, there was no talk of mental health or anything like that. You mm. just got on. You got a kick in the ass, and mm. but there was there was a lot less. Um, obviously, no mobile phones or anything like that. So I, you probably weren't slagged off on social media every day and things, you know. So it was slightly easier from that. And uh, everything was happening maybe a slower pace back then. You know, everybody, when it started riding now, they expect to be take over the world in two seasons. That didn't happen back then. No, it didn't happen. And, and I was at a point of point one day in Carrick Tool, and um, Gerald O'Donovan came into me and he said, tidy yourself up. He said, there's a good trainer here to see you. And I was after riding in a, again in a novice riders race, and John Edwards came in and... He said, would you be interested in coming to England? And I said, not at all. You know, I was just getting going. And um, and it was two months later when I had a phone call to, to ride in Chelton in an amateur race. So, um, yeah, at times it took a lot, lot longer to get going. So I went to him. But people, I suppose the first one that got going, I thought really quick, was Adrian Maguire at that time. Mm. He came to England and straight away he was leading conditional, you know, and, and then, of course, he was after AP came along and, well, we know what he did, but he was champion every year he rode, you know. So it, were, it was remarkable if you were riding winners at 19 or 20, you know, mm. you were only getting rides at that stage. And you ride many pint of pint winners here before you went to England? No, I think, I think eight or ten winners pint of pinting. Um, but only did it for like a season and a half, something like that, um, and, and went to England. Went to England as a road as an amateur. And um, my first ride, I went to Cheltenham, I'd say it was probably my first time out of Ireland. And um, he was second in the Kinmuir. And a month later, he ran, or whatever later, he ran in the Scottish National, and he was second to a horse called Roller Joint, won it with Brendan Powell riding him. Mm. And I was claiming seven. So... That was a you know a huge occasion, and to, to come back, I remember going to a pint of point in, in Cork the following day, and it was like you'd 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 won a Grand National, you know, <laughs> it was different world, um, but it was a huge trail. And then I came back and rode for John Edwards at the beginning of the next season. Um, he had a couple of early horses August time, of course, no summer jumping, and um, I stayed in, and he asked me to stay, and I stayed. But but I then, funnily enough, had to start from scratch. There was, there was Tom Morgan, a guy called Die Tag. Philip Finton was champion amateur in England um, mm-hmm. that year. He was based at John he Edwards, was, wasn't he, that yeah, time? Yeah, um, who was, again, fantastic rider. Um, well, all of them were, but I didn't know going there that I was going to be, like, fourth in the line. And um, as time went by, it took a year or two, and it, I went home for a little while as well. <laughs> and it wasn't coming back. And he, I, I had a bad fall one day, broke my collarbone and I went home and I wasn't coming back and he rang me up and he said, listen, if you come back I'll let you ride a good horse called Clefalda um, in a novice chase at Kempton. And he was a very good horse, he was placing the stairs. And um, he got beaten in a novice chase, Jamie Osborne beat me on, on a horse that went down on one of Hennessy. And um, he got beaten in a novice chase and I stayed. So that was it. <laughs> and did you turn professional straight away then when you went over there? Or did yeah, you ride as an amateur for a while? Uh, I turned professional when I went there to stay, yeah, yeah. So, um, and it, you know, it, it, once it got going, it was good. And yeah. John Edwards at that time was one of the top trainers over jumps in England, wasn't he? 
he had a lot of horses, um, and, and, and you know there were some very good horses, Yahoo and horses mm. like that. You know, second the Gold Cup and um, Pearly Man, Champion Pearly Chase, Man, yeah, a couple of years before you. Yeah, now, my wasn't first it? job was hosing Pearly Man's legs. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Every night sitting on a bucket, I'll tell you, it was cold. <laughs> it was colder than here. <laughs> it was absolute torture. Um, I didn't have to muck out in the evenings, but I had to hose Pearly Man's legs. Yeah, I'll never forget it. And so I think I only I was only there for him running once, but. I actually sat on him and he was an amazing beast to ride. He was an action to die for. He's a beautiful horse. But um, yeah, it went on from there, but there was there were good times, yeah. Monsieur Le Cure, yeah. he was a good horse. Uh, John Edwards as well. You rode him a few times, didn't you? Wouldn't yeah, you wouldn't I rode him, much, rode him in the early days and then I either got injured or broke up or something and Peter Niven rode him and he won a son of lines on him. Yeah, so um, he was the last good horse that, that John Edwards had, really. And what other kind of good horses there that people would remember from your when from your time at John Edwards? Ah, uh, well, there was. I was just after um, the horse that Jimmy Frost won a national on, Little Polvier. I was mm. after him. Um, so you know, there was oh, there was a whole load of horses. Like there were good handicappers. I remember just spring to mind Charter Hardware, Berling Jack, all these horses. You know, they were they were running. You know, all these big handicaps. Um, but Pearly Man was the standout at the time, yeah. Where was John Edwards based? He was down in, in Herefordshire. Mm. And, of course, which leads on again, Venetia was assistant. Venetia mm. Williams was assistant there. And um, that's how that connection came about. Um, he was down near Hereford, but a be- beautiful place. Mm. And, and, you know, at that time it was a big yard, but things change. Mm. Mm. And obviously, we'll come to that later on. It just you're going to you're, like you're speaking about Edward O'Grady. The, it, the wheel turns full circle. Like you ended up uh, starting off at PP Hogan, then you were with Edward O'Grady, whose of course uh, mother was a PP sister. And then towards the latter end of your career, after meeting Venetia Williams in the early days, and John Edwards' as assistant, you wrote a lot of big winners for her as well. That will come to yeah, later we on. Did, we did we did. I had a great time with Venetia. She had a few fantastic horses during them times. Um, but it was the full circle and, and the great days with Kim Bailey in the middle, yeah. We were uh, just touching on the John Edwards uh, job, how that came about. When you finished up with John Edwards, what next? And how yeah, long did you spend in John Edwards? I was there for two or three years and, of course, well, the connection with Venetia, that came later. Um, I then, John was going down on numbers and he, was, he went down quite a lot on numbers. Um, you know, just the old handicappers were retired, they weren't replaced and things move on. Mm. And he obviously was friendly with Nicky Henderson, um, which a lot of people wouldn't know. And I'm not sure I'd ridden for, for Nicky, but um, he said, would you go for an interview? And I drove off down to Lamborn anyway. And at this time I was, I was getting outside rides. I'd ridden a few winners for Kim Bailey at the time, at the end of the season. And um, and this was the end of the season again. No summer racing. So I went to I went to Nicky's, met him, and he told me I could ride, but I couldn't. He'd take me on his first jockey, but I wouldn't be riding Remittance or Travado, and they were the two top horses in the yard. So Dunwoody was, I think Richard was going to Martin Pipes at the time, and he was keeping the rides on the two of them. And I told him I'd think about it. I was driving in. Again, as true as whatever, I was driving out the gate and the phone rang and it was Kim Bailey. And Lamborn is a very close-knit area, as you well know. <laughs> and um, he said to me, I hear you're in Henderson's. I couldn't believe that someone would know I was even there. And he said, would you call around to me? So, I'd, so I drove into his place and um, he offered me the job straight away. And I'd ridden winners and I had a connection with the late John Dorkin, um, of course, of Easterbrack fame. And John was a great man, but John worked for Kim and he worked across the road for Oliver Sherwood. And he was the one who really put me forward to Kim. And um, so I took the job and, and it went on from there. But it was funny that Mick Fitzgerald came along and took the job with Nicky Henderson. So both of us had a, had a good number out of it, you know. It's just, isn't it amazing mm. how things just pan out in life, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. If, you know, who's to know what, what would have happened to either of if, if, if we swapped. But um, it worked thankfully for the, for the good I think and obviously Kim Bailey was one of the top top yards in England at the time as well and that led on to some of your greatest days in the saddle didn't it yeah we, we had some great success together fantastic days and um, Eddie Hales definitely needs a mention he was there as head man and we had great times and um, it, it was great fun 
as you can imagine, fun. There was there was a lot of fun, but there was good yards in Lamborn. Um, Oliver Sherwood and Jamie Osborne were across the road from us. Large action era um, in that yeah. as well, yes. It was, it was almost yeah. the golden era of Lamborn jumping, if you like. It was, I suppose, you know. Obviously, it was there was Fred Winter well before that, but, but this was putting it back where it belonged, really, Lamborn. Um, Oliver Sherwood, Kim Bailey um, and Nicky Henderson just the other side of the village. So there were, there were three huge yards, yeah. And mm. uh, at that stage, Kim Bailey was an up-and-coming trainer. He was. He, he, he had pulled off some touches, like Mr Frisk, and, you know, he had some good horses, but he then propelled into, well, what at the time were big numbers. We were up to 100 horses, I'd say, at, at one stage. And, um, yeah, we had fantastic times. We'd, we... Um, you know, Kim was a great trainer and, and Eddie Hales was a fantastic head man. Mm. And three of us worked together and, and it really did. It worked well, yeah. Then it leads mm. on, of course, to Alderbrook and Mastery Oats. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, it's a long time ago. But they were, I suppose, you know, Master Oats came through the ranks and he was, he was a handicapped chaser. Lots of stories about him. He bled badly. There was, um, you know, he was... He, the, what you're seeing here is Alderbrook actually down the inner with the white noseband. He's a little bit long there, Kev, now for you. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's amazing that this horse hadn't ran over hurdles up to three weeks before the race. He ran once a year and a half previous. And, and he won the pre Royal Oak two starts before. And he won the Kingwell before the... Yeah, just the Kingwell, and that was his only run over hurdles for us. But he won a group race um, in France with Julie Cecil before. He, he, he had, he'd won, he'd won a group two in soft ground, but you've, you've my silver large action, Denoli. Um, all the Brook Fortune and Fame was in it. You know, it was a fan, fantastic race. Fortune and Fame on the outside. And um, so my, my silver had won the Triumph the year previous. Large action in the middle. And um, this fellow, now the ground was heavy, and I don't think the ground has been heavy in Cheltenham ever since, um, since then. But um, he, was a, he was a great little horse. He was, he was a terrible mover, but um, he, had a, he had a very high cruising speed. And, um, you know, he travelled through the race absolutely amazing you know trying to get him settled was the problem really and um he galloped all the way to the line yeah because he was very free wasn't he he was he was free and um you know he had a lot of light i went down the inner on him he had a lot of light and um you know i think it was the third hurdle he gave it a bit of a bit of a, a clout and it was probably the best thing ever happened but he was a good horse what are we thinking going into that given his lack of experience well he's like we 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 did a huge amount of work at home yogi bridesner um, and myself, we did a lot of work with him. When we got him, he would hardly jump a pole on the ground, and we were nearly blindfolding him going to hurdles in the finish. We were we we were lining two handicappers in front of him, and I would stick straight behind him, and that he couldn't see a hurdle and go as fast as they could leg it, just to see. You know, he was he was a colt, so just to see what he'd do. And you know, Kim tells a great story. Just before he went to the Kingwell. I schooled him and there was two horses upsides and at the last hurdle he jumped straight between the two of them and just blew them apart and um, Kim got into the car and drove straight to the betting office and backed him at 50 to 1 for the champion hurdle really? and he built a new lads hostel out of it really yeah so um, so you know on the, on, the, on the day yeah it was at that time again and going back Tommy Carmody would have been a huge hero who was well retired at the time and I hadn't ridden a Cheltenham Festival winner till him. I couldn't believe this yeah. until you, you told me this at Punchestown yeah. only a few and weeks so ago. So I was, I was walking out of the way room in Cheltenham and the late John Mulhern pulled me aside and of course he knew that Carmody was a hero and um, he said um, a message from Tommy Carmody. He said, take your time, don't be in front before the last and you'll win. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And I know, right, this is a stupid question for you. You don't do pressure and you never did, right? But... What was it like? You're going, you're you're riding a big player. Was he second or third favourite in the champion hurdle? You had never ridden a winner at the festival at this mm. stage. Was was were you a little bit feeling the pressure a bit? I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't, I don't remember it. But you listen to Roy Keane and all these people as sportsmen. If you're not putting yourself under pressure, you shouldn't be in the game. You have to to be at at that level of. You want to win and you want to, you know, you have to have the hunger to win. Um, and you'll put yourself under a certain amount of pressure. But you, you got to go out there with a, with a pair. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. um, and, but there wasn't probably huge pressure with him because nobody, OK, he had won the Kingwell on the bridle. But, but it wouldn't have been a surprise if he finished fourth. Um, there was pressure from ourselves, you know, as in Kim and myself and Eddie Hales and whoever that were closely connected. We thought he had a huge chance, but 
um, yeah, just listen. He, he won well anyway. And so way to break here at Cheltenham Festival, Duck, Champion Hurdle. Yeah, Have you they, in the Champion Hurdle before that? I, I missed the winner the year previous. Um, I got banned, got a two day ban, and missed the ride on Flaky Dove. Mark Dwyer rode her, yeah. Um, but it was funny, after Alderbrook won, we were having breakfast the next morning after riding out, and, and Kim said to me, he said, Have you anything any good today? And I said, I ride two for the Duke. I said, They have chances, and the two of them won. Putty so, Road and Caddy. Yeah, and Caddy, yeah. So, so there you go. And how did that, because uh, you weren't, you were never really associated with the Duke, right? So why did you come in? Was Adrian Maguire stable jockey at the time? Yeah. So Adrian was either either banned, there was a, his late, I think his late mother had died or passed away at the time, um, or else he was banned. It was one of them years. Adrian missed a few festivals. Mm. And um, the Duke drafted me in and um, liked riding for the Duke. Hey. This will happen. Putty Road was a Larry horse. Did he go to took out the second last hurl for Yeah, Putty Road, yeah. yeah it, and again, funny story on him. Um, the Duke said to me in the ring, he said, what do you know about this fella? And um, I said, Charlie Swan told me from Ireland. I said, as he'd known him from here. Was it Christy mm. Roach training him? Edna O'Brien. Edna Jim, O'Brien. Jim Ryan, his yeah. former owner before Martin St. Quentin bought him. Did he win two bumpers on him? He did, yeah. Have, yeah. He did. I think he might have won a, a maiden a hurl maybe in Clonmel or somewhere like that. But Charlie had told me anyway, he said, listen, he stays all day, kick for touching. So I said to the Duke in the ring, I said, Charlie Swan tells me, ride him handy, kick for touch the top of the hill. And the, the late Duke turns to me and he says, hey, correct, kick for touch at the bottom of the hill, not the top. <laughs> Here we go. But he only won, he won a short head or a neck or something. Mm-hmm. Jamie Osborne, funny enough, was second. And um, yeah, he was a tough, tough, hardy horse. And then Caddy won the... I think the mile may have fleet, maybe. Um, two and a half mile beat Dublin Flyer, Brendan Powell. Um, so they were... They, yeah, um, it was funny. It was just a week went from... And that led on then, of course. Yeah, and that was yeah. the time the festival was only three days. So you'd never ridden a winner at the Cheltenham mm. Festival. Now you've won the Champion Hurdle, your first winner in Alderbrook. Following day, you rock up. Potty Road wins. Caddy wins. You're bursting with confidence now, heading for yeah. past the roads and the gold. Yeah, Cup and, and every everything else. I think you know you, there were 15 races you could ride in, and I think every, every horse I rode, I think I rode in the 15, and every horse I rode, there was only two out of the first four for the week, which was which was quite remarkable. And to tell you quickly, I went to Utoxeter on the Saturday and got a bad fall in the first, and I thought, well, that was a great week. And um, picked myself up off the ground, and, and an hour later I went out and won the Midlands National for Philip House. So, uh-huh. On what? Uh, on oh, a horse called Lucky Lane, was it, or something like that? Right. Beat Charlie Swan, funny enough, on one of pipes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, long time ago, but listen, so that's when things are rolling, yeah. Right, we're going to have a look at Master Oates winning the Gold Cup. How was his prep going into this, Norman? Yeah, he'd won, he'd, he'd won, was it the. Uh, Welsh National Year previous with a lightweight. And, was that um, running Newbury that year, no? It was. And um, then he won the... He won He won in... Uh, um, oh, I can't think. It was Peter Marsh Chase or something, which was moved to Kempton. Um, listen, he was an out-and-out out plodder. He, he loved heavy ground. And if you notice, the track this year, they, they raced on the outside track, so there was only one fence in the straight. So the Gold Cup was actually probably the guts of three and a half miles. Why was um, that? The ground was too heavy on the inside. They could, it was unraceable on the inside. But um, he, st- he just stayed and stayed. He was, a, he was not a good jumper, and he jumped terrible the first circuit. And I pulled him wide on the second circuit down the back, and he just took off. And... Um, he was he was a tough tough horse and um, you know he'd he'd run through a brick wall for you. Um, but yeah, I'd say there was more pressure on him now, Kev. If I, if I had to had to admit the pressure, there was Why? probably a bit on him. He was favourite and and the ground turned up the suit and um, there was pressure riding him because he wasn't a good jumper and um, you wanted to get him around basically and. You know, I, I thought if I got him around, he'd win. Um, I suppose the pressure is of falling off him, probably. Yeah. I'm just looking at the lads coming back in. Dean Gallagher, there's... That's Minnie Holmes. That's Richard Dunwoody, Minnie Holmes. Yeah, of course, she went on to win a national. Uh, Graham Bradley's gone by. Was that cool? Co- Mary, Mary, Mary Gale, Gale yeah. Mary Gale. Mary Gale, a good horse, yeah, who I'd, I'd ridden a bit as well. But, um, yeah... Good days. No, no, this is streamlined stuff. You, you go into the week hoping to get a winner. You won the two biggest races in the festival. Yeah, yeah, it is, I suppose. Well, it, it is and it was, but um, if you want to be, you know, you've done a friend, if you want to be on the top stage, the other races, you want to win. And um, But it is, it's, it's, it's more of a relief than a, 
that I, I'm here and I've made it. It is a relief. If You know, any fellow that wants to be a jockey wants to do it from the age of 10 or 11 or 12 riding ponies. And, um, and you want to keep going then, you know. I talk what? Am I right saying honeysuckle? Henry de Brom had Rachel Blackmore were the next two to do it after you. Yeah, d- yeah. That? They got to thirty mm. years, has it? Yeah, d- um, jockey and, champion and yeah, and trainer and, and jockey yeah. combination. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it is. It's great, but anyway, there we go. It's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and Norman, looking back at uh, some of the riders rode in that champion hurl in particular, you've you've Graham Bradley, Jamie Osborne. They were a great generation, and uh, Charlie Swan, of course, in the mix there. There was some really, as you said, top riders. Yeah, there were. And just, you know, there was Mark Dwyer was still riding. Um, Jamie Osborne, Paul Carberry. Um, oh, there, was a, there was a huge number of jockeys, like, and all at, at a top level. Graham Bradley, Richard Dunwoody, Graham McCourt, um, people, loads that I'm, I'm leaving out. Um, and in this country, OK, I was based in England, but like here you had, a, had fantastic jockeys, you know, Cadbury and, and um, Charlie. And next thing, next thing, of course, the next generation were Tony McCoy and Barry Geraghty and good Adrian Maguire. So even though Tony McCoy and Barry Geraghty were kind of the next generation, we all rode together. Um, so at that time, like, there were 25, 30 that were quite good. And yeah. that all brought you along. It made you all better jockeys. You're going out day in, day out with the likes of Dunwoodies and Jamie Osborne's and Graham Bradley's and all those, like, top, top jockeys. Like, they wouldn't give you an inch. So it made you all better riders. You're all bringing each other on. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. There was a huge camaraderie. Um, but my God, you have to have respect. <laughs> they would absolutely wipe you out. And you had to end up that way as well. Like, there was no, no such thing as, you know, you didn't go up someone's inner. You know, you were driven out your wing. And if you got away with it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, like, Char- Charlie was, was, Charlie Swan was funny. He'd be, you know, he'd be absolutely knocking you down. And then when you put up, ah, sorry, bud, sorry, bud. <laughs> like, you're looking at him, <laughs> Um, and you know he's trying to kill you <laughs> he's absolutely trying to kill you and then he starts laughing at you you know but but there was that that respect between everyone that um you know it was it's a tough game and still i'm sure it's the same today you know when you go out there it is it's it's a hard business someone said to me the other day them jump jockeys are wired a bit different and it's it's only now looking back at it and you know of course I'm like you are still riding out every day and doing everything but I I do believe Ke- Kevin, oh, I know right now anymore but it was a little worse than the horse there is it, you know it, it, there is definitely a little bit of madness involved isn't there yeah. definitely Richard Dunwoody before <laughs> yeah Oh, will, we wait till pa- will we wait for the next part for it's done with it? No, you can't. I have nothing to say okay. about it. OK, we're going to start off our next segment, of course. We just touched on him briefly. Richard Dunwoody, one of the greatest riders of all time. What was he like to ride with? Horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, as you said, one of the great riders. Um, everyone looked up to him, you know. Uh, Ruby Walsh came along and... You know, he was his hero, and he was my hero. He was everyone's hero. Um, but you talk about people being slightly wired wrong. <laughs> he, he, he was a, an ultra professional, but my God, he was tough. He was, he was just completely driven. Um, I'll tell you, I was walking the track one day with him um, at Cheltenham. He's walking along like this, and um, Kieran O'Toole was our agent at the time, as you well know. And um, Kieran, for some reason, was booking his English rides. And I had known that Kieran was about to ring him about a horse. But anyway, um, Mickey Henderson had a horse entered somewhere, and Richard phoned Kieran to phone Henderson to ride the horse. And um, <laughs> when, when he rang Richard to tell him he wasn't riding it, he <laughs> says, "You phone him back and you ask him effing why not." <laughs> so there was no such thing as you can't ride it. It's why not. Yeah. But, but he was the best um, at that time. Mm. Yeah, but he was an outstanding rider. Um, Tough man, but a great, great rider. He really was. Did he came tutor, in, he came in one day. Did back, Henderson, did he? <laughs> yeah, oh, I don't know. <laughs> he came in one day. I remember he got a fall in the triumph hurdle at the, at the third hurdle, and it, he was kicked down to the water jump. Like, uh, he was absolutely... Anyway, all his front teeth were gone. There was blood everywhere. And I was sitting at the table, and he came back in, and he's just sat there. There's blood spattered. And I says, right, Woody. And he goes, through the saddle at the table, he says, yeah, Why? 
<laughs> I know the man would be dead. Says, yeah, why? There's blood spattered everywhere. Which, you know, that was him, but he was tough, but he was he was a very, very good jockey. And how did you all get on with, with the likes of Richard outside yeah. of the wearing? Was yeah, he, great. Did he socialise much with you? Ah, uh, yeah, he did. <laughs> He did. He was. He wouldn't stay out late like us, but um, <laughs> he was. Um, he was tough. I suppose Woody kept himself to himself a little bit more than most of us. But you know, we're talking about how tough a business it was. Every one of us on a Saturday night or whatever, we all got together and we always had great fun and great parties. The Not Queens. like today. Yeah, yeah. You didn't live too um, far away from no, the Queens, did you? no, no. I had a house right at the back of it for fear I had to do too much walking. <laughs> yeah. There, there was a little drain on the way down to that house. Uh, did you, did you fall into it? You did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of a job to get you out one evening for Yeah, we, we, uh, we, had some, <laughs> we had some great times there. We did. Some fantastic times. He's brushing yeah. over that story, Brad. Yeah. That has been fantastic. That's because I can't remember it. <laughs> True story. Well, yeah. Brad, you tell us what happened. I know that's what happened. Uh, good night down to Queen's. Uh, our man got a little bit wayward and into a drain, but... Trim's about this width and his wedge, his legs and the head are like this and I I don't know how we got him out or how he got into it but it was uh, it was uh, yeah good times and, and uh, back to Dunwoody and Richard of course when he moved to Ireland he was a different man I, you know the, the intensity of them championship battles with Adrian Maguire when he started riding in Ireland on Sundays I would only start riding but he was a lot more mellow or seemed to enjoy the game a lot more he, he was and he was totally driven and you know he rode for Martin Pipe in the in-between of to Peter Scudamore and Tony McCoy and there was David Bridgewater and maybe there was someone else in between but I think Pipe drove Dunwoody mad and Dunwoody drove Pipe mad <laughs> um, it, it certainly they had a huge amount of winners and they won they won the Grand National and whatever else but I'm not so sure they, they really connected ever mm. you know Dunwoody was his own man um, but you know he couldn't speak highly enough even though he was tough he was such a good jockey you know he, he really he had, every, he had everything before anyone had you know you can go back to Frankham I don't remember Frankham riding but they all said John Frankham was the best but Dunwoody to me was you know he took it to another level and then everyone wanted to ride like him and um, he just had everything yeah. and of course say uh, I remember well uh, he won the gold with Harlan Cans. he'd won arm he went around won the arm. Galway with one he did he won arm. yeah I was in the house with him that morning where he stayed and um he said, give us the water. And there was this little coffee table and he went to grab the, a big bottle of water from the coffee table and as he grabbed the bottle, he couldn't pick up the water. Mm. He had to turn around and grab it with the other hand. Um, so he rode and he used to ride. He's always, um, in a finish, he'd pick up, he'd, he'd always pick up the stick in the right hand, bang, bang, two smacks, pull it through to the left and finish, always finish the race with his stick in the left hand. And if you look back at Galway that year, he never pulled his stick through to his left hand. He had one hand. He wasn't able to. Um, he wasn't able to ride properly, and um, but he still wanted to keep going. And it's funny, actually, I had the same injury as he did, as in, in, in our necks, and um, it was the same thing, and I'm not speaking out of school because he, he, it's public knowledge, but they, we were seeing the same surgeon in London, and um, I, I said, can we operate? And they, they said to me, no way, there's a 60% chance you'll be paralysed, and they told me Dunwoody wanted to have the operation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that tells you. Um, and he said, to me, he said, I had Richard in here last week, and Richard said, go ahead, let's do it. And, you know, that's where it's slightly different. It's completely. Was no, that they, the they didn't that, say that to me. That was the injury no, to finish them, wasn't it? In, yeah. In, yeah, the, in it, the finish. How long did he ride with that injury? Well, it wasn't. Uh, it's ongoing. And, you know, I did, I did the same thing. You lose use of your arm. And, you're, uh, like, if you gave me a smack in the forehead now, I'd be, I'd be stiff and sore for a few days. And... Um, but Richard, we don't know how long he had that injury because, you know, Richard would ride with a broken leg. But, um, you know, that's, times were different. He, he, was, he wanted to be the first person, I'd say, to ride to 45 or ride to 50 or ride to 60. Um, whereas, whereas at that time, you know, most jockeys retired when they were 35 or mm. so. And um, he just, he was hard enough. He had no nerve and he wanted to bring it to another level. And I'd say he couldn't cope with retiring because he, he had no fear. Um, and and that probably killed him, really, you know. Okay, going back to some of your other Cheltenham winners, Comanche Court, trying oh, yeah. for Ted Walsh. Yeah, that was it. Um, okay, I was based in England and everything, and and um, but I had never ridden an Irish trained winner. Um, if that, yeah, that does make sense. And um, 
at the time, of course, not like today, um, there was very few Irish winners. I remember when I think it was Edward O'Grady trained a winner was the only was the only winner the Irish had at the festival. A mare called Loving Around. Yeah, this is Comanche Court in the Dermot Desmond colours in behind, and um, he'd won a, he'd won a couple. Um, but he was a, he was a beautiful horse and a lovely horse to ride. Um, not a huge horse, but he was he had great strength. That's the Richard Dunwoody actually on shooting light in the red. And um, Ted actually said to me in the ring, he said, "What are you going to do?" So I was telling him this and that, and he said, "Ted, as only Ted would." He says, "You ride him like there's a maid in Ireland, Clan Mel." And um, but he was a, he was a tough horse. But you, you talk about, you know. Okay, Tiger Roll won a Triumph Hurdle and whatever else, but this horse went on. Did he won an Irish National, didn't he? Um, yes. He was second. He was second to best mate in the Gold Cup when he made a very bad mistake at the second last. And um, you know he was he was an absolute fantastic horse and a brilliant chaser. And you know he was probably some people could say that he might have won a Gold Cup if he didn't make the mistake. But I was lucky enough to ride him before Ruby and. Um, I suppose to what I remember about that day was the was the cheering and the reaction you got because Ted was so well known. Mm -hmm. I have to give Ted a mention; he was a fantastic trainer. You know, mm -hmm. he did a fantastic job with all them good horses, Papillon and he, whoever. He came up with a good quote that day actually about Ted: he "Can train as well as talk." <laughs> yeah, 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 he can, but he can, he can. And um, you know, it's there wasn't Ted wouldn't have had any Cheltenham horses at the time, and um, he mapped him out mm. perfectly. Yeah, he did, was a, he was a very good horse. Did Ruby actually lead you up in Comanche Court? He didn't. Uh, young Ted led a him young up. Young Ted, right? Yeah, yeah, but Ruby was there. Yeah, in the background. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And Norman back in front, another one we're going to look at. He was a very good horse. Yeah, a, a very fast horse, and um, Edward Train is my last Cheltenham winner actually, and. Um, that was on his outside in the purple is Barry Garrity actually on Kicking King and um, Tony McGoy in front he kicked for touch at the top of the hill and I thought he was gone and I probably got there too soon as usual but um, fast horse um, had a heart murmur the following season and never really came back to his best but bolted in this day and um, again I remember going out to ride him Carl Llewellyn was sitting next to me and he said to me this will win won't it and because this Cheltenham you think um, you know you're, you're thinking maybe it won't but but he did, he absolutely bolted him. He was a good horse. And like a really good field in behind you that day, and you travelled like a bird on Yeah, he did, he did, he did really travelled. And, and you know, you were going out on a horse like that, and at the time, it, Edward O'Grady was the best trainer you could ride for. He did, he did Cheltenham record to die for, and um, again, turned him up on the day perfectly. A Norman Day reception of the Irish train winners. Yeah, very <laughs> different, very, very different. And I think that's what Comanche Court in him, um, they were very different. Being an Irish person, you know, you're bound to have that little, little bit of a different reaction, and um, it was fantastic. Huge, huge cheering. Yeah. Monsignor, another horse. Yeah, an exceptional horse. Broke the track record. Broke the track record in the Sun Lions hurdle, and Mister Brack had won it the year previous. So that's he was quite a remarkable horse. Got a leg, never came back to his best. But you know, if you had to pick, I suppose a good hurdler, he was. He beat best mate. Yeah, he beat he beat best mate. The ground was quick this year, or quickish. He beat best mate in the Tollworth hurdle over two miles previous to this, and um, we ran him in this. Or Mark Pittman trained him, and um, but he was a, he was a good jumper, a huge big horse. Brendan Powell won the bumper on him um, before this. Um, we schooled him over fences the following season, and and um, or maybe at the end of this season we schooled him over fences, and he was a brilliant jumper, but never never came back. I don't think he ever ran again actually. Yeah, good horse. Direct route. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> we, we're showing loads of winners, right? But we just oh, know that finally got away. Uh, so, so, is this you were fronting? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, listen, we were building you up there. Building so me up, yeah, thanks. Out of it, yeah. Direct route, great horse, yeah. Unfortunately, he was the one that got away, yeah, or one of them. That was some um, race. Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. I know you didn't race. Think it on the day though, when you were by the line. But. No, he was. He was not the easiest horse to ride. Um, you, you, one minute you were travelling, next minute you didn't think you were, and you can see him here. He's off the bridle, and you're not going to win. And all of a sudden, he gets there. But um, AP McCoy in front, and Edward on blur, and. Um, I didn't think I was going to get to him, and sure enough, I did it last. Now, it looks as though I headed him up the running, but I'm not quite so sure I did. But I suppose the most annoying thing about this is that if there's anyone other than AP. But um, listen, it was a fantastic race. I won a Tingle Creek on him, and he won, he won a Martell chase, or maybe two of them. And um, 
I still don't think today that he got done, but there he did. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the range dropped, Fran. <laughs> what do you think going by the lines? Do you think you had it? I'd have been happy with a dead heat. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know. Um, still looking back, and I don't think I'd have, I'd have changed anything, you know. He got done on the knot, and that was it. Yeah. Mm. Our producer and uh, Jamie Spencer has been on the phone already. <laughs> Pizarro, Cheltenham bumper. Yeah, you talk about one that got away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got, got away though, I nearly sent you into the, into the Guinness tent. Yeah, there was a, that was an amazing one. Uh, I was riding Rhinestone Cowboy, Pizarro in front. Um, you know, the guys they're talking, they're talking about ushing now going riding the bumper. Well, this time it was, but here we go. Jamie, so Jamie comes across and bang, and um, came back over again near the line, but as Rhinestone Cowboy, he sort of got very tight all the way up the running. So it was a tricky one, really, because I was riding Fred with O'Grady, mm -hmm. and of course, riding back in front. Um, back in front was third in that race. Um, two fantastic horses, but no, today I don't think I don't think he'd have kept the race, to be honest. Were you yeah. surprised with the outcome of the result after being in the Shores inquiry? I was, and, and it obviously makes no difference now, but. You go into the go into the steward's room and you say say whatever, but I I thought it was a foregone cl conclusion. I just thought, listen, they have to turn this around, do, do, and do they that, didn't. But do you think that set off an era in the UK where it was first past the post, no matter what, and you're going to keep the race? That's what it's appeared to me in the last fifteen twenty years. Yeah, most yeah most horses kept the race. Mm. You had to do something something pretty bad to lose it, but um, he kept it, and you know, fair play to Jamie. He always likes me about it, so, so does he. <laughs> um, He'd be loving this at yeah. home. So oh, he'd be loving yeah. it, yeah. yeah. We could show it again. Just, uh, <laughs> that brings us on to Lady Rebecca, and of course your connection, which is a hugely successful connection, with uh, Venetia Williams. Yeah, um, Venetia started training, and, and um, she's, she always has been. She's an exceptional trainer. Lady Rebecca, tiny little filly. Um, you know, she was bought cheaply, and she racked up. She, she won the... This was the stairs. Have you any of her winning? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. So she. <laughs> That's the producer's fault. No, no. Yeah, she was. She was. She was third in the stairs this year. Anzum got up. Got up to win. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Johnson. And that was was that Lacoudre, Charlie Lacoudre Swan in front. front. I think just getting caught. Yeah, yeah. Anzum got up. Um, she didn't quite. Lady Rebecca didn't quite stay three miles. And if now looking back at it, I probably didn't give her a good ride. I was upsides turning in. Um, she won three cleave hurdles on the bounce, um, two five. That was probably her ideal trip. Uh, but she's a great little mare. She really was. And you know, you look at it now. What would she have won? Would she have been a Quivega? You know, would she have won three or four hurdles? She probably yeah. would. Probably would have done. Um, well, she was good. Yeah, she's good. Probably didn't quite see it out. I'd say. And was Lady Rebecca the first filly or the first mm -hmm. horse that the high profile horse that really started to get Phoenicia Williams going? Yeah, she was in the early days. I'm not sure herself and Teton Mill. Um, she had some quite quite good handicappers, but Teton Mill came from the from the Hunter Chase circuit, mm. and um, he was he was well up there with one of the best horses I ever rode. I'd say he was he was an amazing horse, and um, he won he won the Badger Ale Chase in when Canton didn't. Funny, I was coming in off the track, and oh, this him winning the King George, and. Um, he won, he won in, in Wincanton, I said to Venetia after the race, would you have him entered in the Hennessy? And she said, I put him in this morning. And she said, why? And I said, because he's going to win after track. And at the Hennessy, he won the Hennessy with tin something on his back. And at the Hennessy, I said, is there any way you have him in the King George? And she said, I have. I said, this thing won't get beat. And you could just, you could, he was a brilliant, brilliant jumper. He was like riding a pony. You could put him where you want, do what you want. And um, he went from this... We then went for a prep run, and he, she dropped him back to two miles, three furlongs around Ascot, and he won. He beat a horse called Cinderella Batruti, who was a good two and a half mile horse, mm. and he went for the Gold Cup. And um, I was getting out of the car park, and our great friend Pat Healy was with me driving, and he said, "What you think of horse in the Gold Cup?" I said, "This won't come off the bridle." I said, "This is absolute certainty," and nobody had kind of thought of him that good, and um, jumped the first or the second open ditch and slipped the tendon off his hock, and that was it. Finished, never ran again. 
running so out. yeah, but but he listen. He won a King George. He won a Hennessy. He was a, he was a great little horse. Not over big, but a fantastic jumper. Yeah. That's some statement you come out with. Like you've ridden some amount of aeroplanes down through the years, and what you said about him, that could be the best of all. Well, he, he was bang up there, but I think the beauty of him, he had speed, and his his jumping was exceptional. It didn't. He wasn't standing outside the wings, but he just he gained ground at every finch, you know. And he was he was just a very very good horse, very simple horse. Um, he'd have won over two miles or three miles, it wouldn't matter, you know. Um, he just travelled through a race the same. But, um, yeah, they were good, yeah. Norman, coming to the latter stages of your career, we spoke about all those proper, proper horses, but you still had plenty of proper horses when you actually moved back to Ireland. What was the reason behind moving back to Ireland? Was it always the plan to firstly move back to Ireland when you retired, but yeah. to end your career here? Yeah, um, to be quite honest, I thought I'd get an extra couple of years out of it to... The run of the day stuff and run of the mill stuff in England, um, you know, you weren't getting a kick out of going to Plumpton on a Monday and whatever. So I thought I'd come back here, I'd prolong it probably another season or two, and um, then unfortunately injuries caught up. Um, so thankfully Edward O'Grady was very good to me at the time, and um, I said I'll move home full time and hit some good horses, including Nick Dundee, Ned Kelly, back in front, kick them. There's some great horses. Mm. And um Go Roger Go, yeah. that was another smart yeah, horse. Wasn't he it? was, yeah. Um there was there was a fair team of horses there at the time and I came back and I was riding them and um that's so so I'd have loved it for you know, I I think I stopped riding at thirty four and um I'd have loved to last another couple of years, but um he was very good to me and um we had to stop through injury in the finish. Yeah. Nick Dundee he was a very, very good horse, but very fragile, wasn't he? Well, he wasn't that fragile, but he was. He needed very heavy ground, um, an exceptional horse. He was, I think it was the Moriarty in Leopardstown, um, that grade one novice, anyway, the 2.5 or whatever. And I remember cross from the stands that day, he was he was almost a fence clear, and there was horses like Promalee behind him who were grade one winners, and I couldn't hold him. He was going to the second last that day, and I was still trying to get him to settle. You know, he was an amazing high cruising speed and heavy ground, and... Went to Cheltenham then in the Sun of Lions and fell. And, um, you know, of course, Paul Cabri will say, he wrote, looks like trouble. He'll say I had a one or whatever. I couldn't hold one side of him. I thought he was doing a hack canter. And, um, you know, it, interest, it, that was a desperate signal, to be quite honest, because, um, you know, John Magner had asked me to ride him and ride Ned Kelly for as long as they were around. And... Um, and I'll tell you a funny one, actually. I got a phone call driving out of the car park that evening, and it was John Magner, mm. um, who wasn't obviously at the races. And he said, listen, he said, we're going to try our best to save his life because he had, he had fractured a hind leg. And um, they kept him, kept him for two years in Coolmore. And, you know, there'll be people out there saying, oh, they don't care about jump horses or care about whatever. But he did. Um, they kept him and they minded him and they brought him back. And he ended up winning the Hilly Way, I think, two years later and then retired. Um, but he was an exceptional horse, never never got to see the best of him, you know. And given what lo- looks like trouble went on to do. Yeah, he went on went down and won a gold cup and um now it, you know, we had a meeting before that before that race that time, um should we run him in the gold cup or the novice and um funny enough John Magner, I remember him saying I said to him he'll win the novice this year in the Gold Cup next year and he said to me he said uh, he said can you guarantee me he said that any of us will be here next year and that was the horse and us and um, sure enough the horse wasn't wasn't to be running the following year but um, I didn't think he'd have won a Gold Cup anyway because I didn't think he had enough experience um, as was proven probably right listen we got the fence wrong anyway and he fell and it's history but he was an exceptional horse in his time um, and then the other fellow of course was Ned Kelly he won an Irish champion hurdle and um, he was a very good horse as well yeah. were the two of them half brothers were they? Yeah, I think, think they were yeah yeah. one was to be my native and a supreme leader I think they were they were good anyway yeah. Ned Kelly he wasn't the most natural of jumpers is no he wasn't a little bit straight of his back but still high cruising speed good horse you know good horse yeah. Generosa <laughs> Little chat, the winner. Yeah. Fran ties into this. Oh one, yeah, about Fran does. Yeah, Fran. <laughs> yeah, G- Generosa, um, the late John Hassett, who we only lost, was it six or eight months ago mm. last year? Anyway, um, John was talk about the crazy lunatics. He was, but <laughs> what a man! He was, he was absolute. He was the funniest man you ever rode for, and I suppose a lo- lovable rogue. He was, he was priceless. Um, Generosa with the Cheltenham for the pretemps and will you ride her and all the rest and the laughing and joking and sure enough you know now I dropped her out last and I remember that day Tony McCoy and myself were last he rode a horse called Gallant Moss 
and after jumping the second hurdle, he said he turned around and he said, Norm, he says, this race is over, we're too far behind it. The leaders were down by the mm. water jump, and I said, no, I said, I guarantee you they're going too fast. And the two of us jumped the last upsides in front. So I thought, you know, that was, it worked out perfectly for the two of us. But anyway, the following morning, I'm sitting at home and phone rings, and the landline, which again, never rang. And um, he said, well, how are you going? I said, Jeez, who's this? John Hassett here. I said, good man, John. He says, um, the old mare is above here. She's like a queen. He says, <laughs> said, will you ride her? And I said, when? He said, tomorrow. And I said, you're running her? He says, yeah, I'm going to run her. And I, I'd taken a ride in the race for Venetia Williams and couldn't ride her. And um, he said, she'll win. He said, she'll win half the track. He said, she had up all her silage last night and she's kicking the pony to death. <laughs> I couldn't get my head around this. And I met him racing that day, the middle day of Cheltenham. And I said, how do you mean she's, she's, um, she's kicking the pony to death? He had brought over a Chetland pony and he was in the stable with her. So, for company. But that was John. But anyway, uh, Tommy Tracy rode her then on the, on the third day. And I think Fran beat her, did he? Yes, uh, Kirwani. I also got beaten. I also, I also, well, uh, I was waiting for the kicker. I also got beaten Jenna Rose in the Labra Coral prior to her winning in Cheltenham. I thought she was a bit faster than what she actually was and cut her throat down the back straight in Leperstown. So all's well that ends well, Norm. Yeah, but she was a very good mare. And um, it was, that was great fun because John Hassett was an exceptional man. He was, he was just great fun to ride for. Um, he wanted to have your wits about you, though, because he could put you up in one that was unbroken or something. But he was great crack. <laughs> he loved putting nine shoes in the horses, too, didn't he? <laughs> Norman, it's just brilliant to just talk back and remember some of those brilliant horses mm-hmm. that you rode, the likes of Alderbrook and Master Oates and Lady Rebecca's and the Ned Kelly's and Nick Dundee's. It, to us, it doesn't seem that long ago, but when you actually start thinking back, you're, it is you're, quite You're not as old as me. <laughs> it is, yeah. We, we've just been saying it is a long time ago. Um, yeah. You can't believe they got the VT in colour. <laughs> <laughs> but they said, yeah, they, said, they, said they were great days, but... Um, Things have moved on and, and things change. And Norman, obviously, your career came to an end. Was it at Down Patrick? No, it was. Yeah, Down Patrick. I um, I had an ongoing neck injury, as we were speaking about earlier. Richard Dunwoody had the same thing, but it was ongoing, and um, it got to the stage that one bad fall was going to stop me. And um, I had a bad fall in in Down Patrick, at at um uh, in a chase, and um, I went to see a surgeon in, in London who I'd been seeing and I hadn't seen for a year and he went through the things like the pins and needles in your arms and everything and he just said, stop. I said, right. So that, that was it. But, you know, I suppose it, if it was today, you'd, you'd have been managed better on the way maybe and you might have lasted another two or three seasons. You know, a friend of myself were talking about it earlier. Mm-hmm. Well, they're talking about the fitness and, and what they go through now. We don't think they're riding any better, but we think they're lasting longer. Mm. Um, and, you know, we're walking around like cripples. Well, I am anyway. So, <laughs> so maybe, maybe you know, in, in 20 years' time, people that will retire at 40 will be running marathons or whatever. But, but um, they are certainly lasting longer. Mm. Aren't they, I think so. Yeah. I think, uh, as you said, it's the ongoing care is the big thing now, isn't it? Um, rather than letting some develop it, you're getting ahead of the situation if you do get a fall or get an injury and that's probably the difference. Yeah and, and you know like I remember going out to ride and you hadn't a clue where you were from the race previous and, and, and that is mm. true um, I remember asking Steve Smedeckles one day, so I'll tell you how long ago it is um, at the start of a race in Windsor and asked him how far this was, I hadn't a clue where it was I had a, had a bad fall earlier you know and um, thankfully um, Jennifer Pugh and all the team in this country are doing a fantastic job you know um, even, especially from the kids starting they have everything in, in, in order now. You know, you know, by the way, my son has started riding and you know, by the way, he's gone on about his helmet and his back mm. protector. And, and when I started, it was the bravest fellow. If you wore a back protector, you were a wimp, you know. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's fantastic to see all this improving. Was it, I know you'd obviously set the wheels in motion for the next career that were what you're doing hugely successfully now. We'll come to that in a moment. But was it hard to take when that doctor said, Norman, you're finished, you can't ride anymore? Yeah, I suppose, it, yeah, it was. It, it's the... It's the transition, not so much hard to take, it's the transition of going away from the everyday thing. As I said earlier, when you're, when you're 12 years of age riding your pony and you want to be a jockey and then you haven't done anything else till you're 34, 35 years of age, um, it's difficult to, to watch television and watch racing. Um, and I suppose the first year or two, people have said, did you miss racing? Mm-hmm. Of course I didn't miss the small meetings, but you'd miss Cheltenham and mm-hmm. Leopardstown and, um, at the big festivals. Um, but once the horses you were riding left the system, mm. um, you were then kind of happy enough that it was it was over, you know. So, um, ah, and you got to, there's no point in looking back and saying, listen, 
that was hard to take or whatever. It was fantastic. I had a good career at it and it was great fun and it's good to be able to look back at it. And you've gone from one hugely successful career into another, pin hooking stores and breeze up horses as well. Mm-hmm. Native Trail, obviously, he's the standout one at the moment and the horse that won the Preakness Stakes, uh, his name escapes me. War yeah, of Will. War of Will. War of Will. And, and we did, well, I don't want to rub it in, but the, um, the ledger winner this year, mm-hmm. Elder Alderoff. We had him as well. So, um, yeah, the breeze up thing, and, and we better give it a mention because we're about to start Cheltenham week. Um, the horses are going to Dubai for the breeze up, and um, the breeze up consigners, they're a small, a small group, really, in, in, in relative terms. They're a small group of people, and they're doing a fantastic job. They're spending more money on yearlings, bringing it to a different level. Um, they've proven for the last 40 years that they're selling good horses but but now they're really selling good horses you know okay I was lucky enough to have native trail and whatever else but but they really are you can go to spare your money go to a breeze up sale you can see it galloping if it doesn't do a clock whatever you know um so we we bought this fellow as a yearling um you know I think he was 65 grand or something and he's champion two-year-old wins everything and he comes out and he wins the guineas and I believe he's staying in training for next season um, which is fantastic and hopefully he'll win a, win a group one again at four um, but so the breeze up season is about to start we're going to Dubai in a few weeks and um, from there then we start off in Newmarket at the Craven Sale then Doncaster for your sharp two year old Ascot types and then on to France a month after that so um, it'll be all go from now on but um, the breeze up, the breeze ups have really stepped it up, and and um, some beautiful horses, and also good horses and stayers like mm-hmm. Elder Alderoff and Trushan, you know the great cup horse. Like you can you can go to a breeze up sale now, and buy a horse that comes up at an average breeze. And listen, if he's bred to be a mile and a half horse, he could be a very good horse. And of course, Libertarian was another one who just got beaten at Derry, wasn't yep. he? He came out of the breeze up sales too, uh, for relatively small money. He did absolutely. So you don't you don't go there just to buy a fast two year old. You buy the buy a mile and a half horse there just as easy. But you you have a big advantage, um, as in you can see them gallop mm. and see if they're sound and all the rest. So um, anybody watching in. <laughs> you know where to spend it, especially you. How, how, how much uh, satisfaction does that give you? Riding winners, great buzz, but you know it's like training or moving on. You, you sell them, but you want them to do well in the back of that. Yeah, Fran. It, well, it's hugely important business-wise mm. that some of them are good, um, or some good. You love to see a horse winning a race, but to have something like them is is different. Um, it gives you more satisfaction, probably, than riding. Um, because you're putting more time into it, you're putting your money on the line, <laughs> um, which is which makes a huge difference. But you know, as you know, Kevin and you, Fran, half an hour after you get off a horse or you fall off a horse, you, you usually have another one half an hour later. Whereas you live with these fellas for six months mm-hmm. and and you hope for a return and then to watch them go on and win for someone else's. It gets you get a great kick. And how many breeds of horses would you consign every year? Oh, we're small numbers. We're only 10, 15 every year. And um, we keep it small and keep it tight. And um, But, you know, the, the, the consigners of breeds of horses, it's gone way more professional. And, and they're putting the money on the line. They're buying better yearlings. You know, they're buying, buying horses for six figures all the time now, you know. And um, I think it's probably proving a point that... It's not just a breeze up horse, it could be a top class racehorse. Of course, and as you said, the first of it is Dubai. That's only the second uh, second uh, sale in Dubai for breeze up second, horses. Yeah, You're bringing sale. three, are you? Bringing three horses to Dubai the, this year, and um, hopefully hopefully they'll sell well. Um, one went there last year, and he returned to Newmarket probably before I got home. And um, he's a winner for William Haggis now. And um, so you can pick up a good horse anywhere or a nice horse anywhere. But um, so it's all systems go now. I met Willie Brown here tonight. I'm sure he'll have two year olds coming out his ears. But um, and of course, Willie was good. one of the founders of the Breeze Up. He was there from the war go, wasn't he? He was. He's been at it a long time, and there's no one better. You know, um, his horses always look fantastic and breeze well. But um, it really is. It's 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 a game that's gone up and up. And was it a bit by accident that you went down that route, or was that kind of the plan when you're coming to the end of your riding? Career? Well, I wanted. I thought I wanted to wanted a um, pint of pointers or bumper horses. I thought I should have and and um, make a living out of them. And my father-in-law Timmy Hyde said to me one day, he said, "What are you going to do with the bad ones?" I kind of hadn't thought about that. And, um, <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was, it was a great question. So so I laughed at him. And um, Eddie O'Leary, funnily enough, asked me to ride a breeze up horse before it retired in Doncaster. And at that time, it was. If a horse went fast, everybody, the eyes were leaping out of their mm-hmm. head looking at this horse, you know. But nowadays, they all go quite quick and they're all very professional. 
and um, I just thought I was able to ride them myself and you could train them yourself and it's in your own control and it kind of came from there. Next generation now, you must be very proud of your son Josh and obviously your daughter Carla who's doing really well in the pony world but Josh only got his amateur licence, he's riding Sunday in Wexford, he's had a handful of rides so far. Yeah, he's had a few rides, um, Gordon, he rides out for a lot and they've been very good to him, especially the older lads there and um, if I could get him to ride out for me now a bit more to be <laughs> way better but anyway, no, he's, listen, he's young, very young, he's only 16, he's getting on great and with your daughter did, did a great time riding ponies. And, um, yeah, it's just great watching. It's great fun. Norman Cheltenham, quick word on Cheltenham, oh. upcoming. <laughs> Give us a couple of Willi- Williamson winners for Cheltenham. What, one horse you'd like to ride if you yeah. were riding? Edward Stone. Really? Yeah, two-mile mm. chase, got the man train, the Malin King, good on the day for the big day. Uh, I think he's a horse, he jumps fantastic, travels well through a race. I'd love to be perching his back coming down the hill. Galloping the Champ, trained well. I think Galloping the Champ has been ridden perfectly for the Gold Cup this season. Mm. Last year he was like a wild lunatic. This year, <laughs> this year Paul Town is dropping him in, burying him in behind. Um, I just think Paul Town has the gold cup in his head for him all year. Um, so Edward Stone, him. I fancy Irish horses. I fancy Barry, Barry Collins horse in the first. Marine um, National. Marine yeah. National. Good mm. mover. Probably going quick ground. Jumps well again. Young Michael O'Sullivan rode him well in Ferry. I said, thought buried him, gave him no light. You know, all them things are a, are a step into a big race like that. It's no point in going around making the running, you know. And um, So, listen, as always, it'll be, it'll be a good week and good fun. Yeah. Great stuff. And yeah. can't let you go, because I know there's people going to be sitting at home going, ask Norman Williamson, who's the best jockey you it? Who's the one that you feared? Or was there anyone that you feared? I have feared Dunwoody could hit you. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, there's no point in... There's no point in um, in picking out one because Richard and Woody, Tony McKay, Adrian Maguire, Charlie Swan, you Ruby Walsh. You said to me, Carlo Allen was um, great man to get a position race. Yeah, it was funny, yeah, mm. yeah. And, you know, there, there, there was a huge amount of top-class jockeys and probably equally as good on the right horse. But I often found on a Saturday when you were lining up in a big race and you were going to go down the inner sit second or third and this fucking Carlo Ellen was always in front of you. <laughs> I think, and, and he won a lot of big races. And you, and you wonder, you know, was it his position and um, things like that in a big race? But um, all them people, there was a, I, I could keep mentioning them. Um, some, some great riders and some, some still good friends and good people, yeah. Mm. Well, Norman, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on, Riz. I know. No, thanks. I, I, threw, uh, bogey I think you there. deserve all the money you're getting. It's freezing here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting at home usually on a Friday night going, look at them two will, fellas. Will, will you have a chat with the boss man back in London there? Tell yeah. them that, I have no doubt. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he'd probably get sacked because it took him a year to get me on here. <laughs> no, lads, thanks. And you are doing a great job, I must say. Thank you. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Will you come back to his next series? Uh, you'd never know. If we mitch- keep mentioning Carawani, imagine he wrote over hers. <laughs> Actually, that. just on Generosa, <laughs> Friday night at Galway, Norman says to me, you're coming for a drive tomorrow. I said, where are we going? Down to Ca- County Clare from Galway, on a Saturday morning Galway, down to see Generosa. John Hass rang him, I have a new bit for, you need a scooter, Norman. The only problem was there wasn't a bit. Hackamore. That's right. No, it wasn't. Ah, no. He got, it was a thing. Oh, so this kind of tell you what kind of a great writer he was. The car went home. <laughs> it was. It was, in all intents purposes, it was a nosebond with a wrench on it at both sides. And um, this did lean our shell. So anyway, she was swizzing around loose over poles, and um, I said, "Will be a jumper over Finch, John?" And he said, "Can't you see her jumping?" He said, "What do you want to ride her for?" So anyway, we got up with the nosebond and we did a few laps at the shed and. So as we're getting back into the car, Fran kindly came down. We had to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. And as we got back into the car, anyway, I said, John, um, do you not want to jump over fences? He said, it's our leopard. And I said, well, what are we doing here? And he says, um, she look at you. He said, look at the state of your man. <laughs> she says, I wanted to get you out of Galway. He says, you've been a complete mess all week. You're, you're so like... we got back into the car at half a state and drove back up the road. But she did. She, she, she appeared in October in Galway with this noseband on. In the parade ring. And um, she, had, she had the noseband thing and a man gave. I said, Jesus, John, I said, I'm not so sure about no bit. And he said, she's, she's a great leper. He said, just say, come up, girl, she'll jump away. Around. Said, 
all of her. She got <laughs> around. She, she, and she did, yeah. She got beat by a good horse, actually, called Saxophone. Mm. But um, but that was John. He was some crack. But anyway, he basically, as I was saying, a lovable rogue. He got us out of bed. That's what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> I remember he said to him, he said, look at your man. He says, why is a sheet? He said, after being in Galway for a week. Yeah. But anyway, there you go. Do you remember that, friend? I actually left you on the couch that night. That's the reason, that's the reason he came with me. You know where to sleep. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. I was yeah. just straight. He was too yeah. mean to pay for a hotel room, was he? I think something's never changed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. No, thanks, thanks so much. Good and to best of luck with the breeze up. Horses thanks very much. Here. And of course, the store horses, of course, Derby Sale. And yeah, we live, we live, we live a few everywhere. Yeah, 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 good stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Thank thanks, you. Guys. Norman, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.